This video lecture, the first of the two-part series of lectures, covers the material presented in section 25.5, Theories in Coordination Chemistry. These theories, which we're about to discuss, are obviously all about producing explanations for these things we observe. For instance, we might want an explanation as to the geometries or shapes that are observed. Or maybe you want an explanation as to why some of these complexes or compounds have the magnetism they do. I mean, we've already discussed the idea of paired and unpaired electrons, but you might ask yourself, how in the hell does this all come together? Additionally, we want to be able to explain the awesome colors that are observed. You would remember, of course, from previous discussions, and perhaps even Chemistry 111a, that color is due to differences in electronic energy levels. But again, what the hell? What's going on? Exactly. Well, that's what these theories are all about. The first theory we're going to discuss is valence bond theory. If anything, this is going to be an extension of what you've learned in Chemistry 111a, the first semester course. As it pertains to this particular field of chemistry, coordination chemistry, we're going to make the assumption that ligands are covalently bonded to the metal using hybrid metal orbitals. The hybrid metal orbitals are going to be vacant. That is, they aren't going to contain any electrons, but they're going to overlap with the ligands orbital, which contains both electrons. That is, the ligand is donating two electrons to the formation of a bond. And because both electrons come from the ligand, as opposed to being a shared responsibility between the metal and the ligand. Because both electrons come from the ligand, we're going to refer to this covalent bond as being a coordinate covalent bond. Hence, in case you're wondering, the name coordination chemistry. Now, as it pertains to valence bond theory, all we really want to be able to do is explain the shapes we observe. And if you remember from Chemistry 111a, your first semester course, the shapes we observe are all about the hybridization of the orbitals. Let's work through some examples. If we have a coordination number of two, we would expect a shape of linear. You might ask yourself, how in the hell does this happen? I would reply, well, we're seeing the hybridization of a single s orbital with a single p orbital to produce two sp hybrids, which, as you might remember, has a linear shape. And then you would obviously hit yourself on the head and say, well, of course, you're right. Now I recall this information. If the coordination number is four, previously you predicted a shape of tetrahedral. Tetrahedral is to be expected if we hybridize a single s and three p orbitals to produce four sp3 hybrid orbitals. The new extra information, the cherry on top, is square planar. If we have a square planar shape, this of course can be explained if we hybridize a single s 2p and 1d atomic orbitals, producing 4 dsp2 hybrid orbitals. If the coordination number is 6, we would predict an octahedral shape, a shape which can be explained if we imagine the hybridization of an s orbital with 3p orbitals and 2d orbitals to produce a total of six d2 sp3 hybrid orbitals. Let's work through some examples together. First, you might consider naming these as we go along, just to test yourself. 
Here we have dicyanocuprate 1. The cyanoligand is monodentate, and there are two. Therefore, we have a coordination number of two and predict the shape to be linear. A hybridization that explains the shape is obviously sp hybridization. Tetrachlorozinc 8 2 has four monodentate chloride ligands, therefore has a coordination number of four. Given the coordination number of four, we predict the shape of tetrahedral, which is to be explained if we have sp3 hybridization. Trucking along, we have the next coordination complex, bis ethylene diamine platinum 2. Ethylene diamine was bidentate, and there are two of them. And so as before, we have a coordination number of 4. But given that platinum in this case is D8, we would predict a square planar geometry, which is to be explained if we had DSP2 hybridization. I know you're enjoying this, and I'm sure you can probably guess where it's going next. Here I have the complex hexa aqua cobalt 3. Water is monodentate. There are six of them, and therefore we have a coordination number of six, from which we predict an octahedral shape, which is to be explained if on the metal we had. D2SP3 hybridization. Damn, that was fun. I'd love to continue, but next up, quite possibly the coolest theory you'll ever learn about in the field of chemistry. Crystal field theory. Crystal field theory is going to make a different assumption. Rather than covalent bonding, as in the previous theory, we're going to make the assumption that we have ionic bonding. Ionic bonding between the ligands, which we take to be negative in charge, and the metal, which we take to be a cation. Now, before I go any further in this video lecture, I might ask that you consider reviewing handout number three, in which crystal field theory is discussed. Just, it's an add-on to this lecture, a little bit extra, Maybe it makes the topic a little bit easier to understand. Not that it's supposed to be difficult. I want this to be easy. Now, in crystal field theory, again, we have this idea or this assumption I have a, of ionic bonding. We have the ligands with their lone pairs. As these ligands approach the metal cation, they'll begin to affect the energies of the d orbitals. Remember, those d orbitals might have electrons, and those electrons, which are negative in charge, are going to experience a repulsive interaction with the electrons on the ligand. Right? Opposites attract, but like charges repel. And so we have to imagine that as these ligands approach the central cation, they have the ability to affect the orbital's energies. Now, to understand how those energies are affected, I need you to recall the different d orbitals. I gotta believe you just didn't put much effort into this in the first semester course. Hell, I know I didn't. But the reality is, visualizing these d orbitals is fairly straightforward. Take these three. They all look like four leaf clovers. And more importantly, how we identify that d orbital describes the location of that so called four leaf clover. The dxy, well, it lies in the xy plane. The dxz, it lies in the xz plane. And the dyz, you've got it, lies in the dyz plane. And so those symbols, dxy, dxz, dyz, 
they just tell us where we're going to find the electrons for those respective orbitals. The dx squared y squared also looks like a four-leaf clover, but here, as the symbol would imply, the lobes lie directly on the bonding axes along the y-axis, along the x-axis, not in between. And the dz squared, the funny looking one with the donut, notice how its orbital lies directly along a bonding axis also, in this case the z-axis. These last two orbitals, because they lie on the bonding axes, are expected to be affected the most by approaching ligands in an octahedral complex. Let's take a different view of this. Let's consider the energies of our d orbitals. In a free metal ion or atom, these orbital energies are all the same. The word for that, degenerate. The orbital energies are degenerate. In the presence of the ligands, however, these orbital energies are all going to increase. But two particular orbitals will see a far greater increase. They are again the dx squared y squared and the dz squared. Now, continuing, it should be obvious from the picture, and of course the image just appeared, there's a difference in energy between these sets of d orbitals. This difference in energy between the d orbitals is referred to as the splitting energy. Splitting energy is represented by a symbol, delta naught. If delta naught, your splitting energy is large, we refer to the complex as being a low spin complex. If delta naught, your splitting energy is small, we refer to the complex as being high spin. We'll talk more about this in a minute. Just splitting energy large, low spin, splitting energy small, high spin. Now, here we have an example of a complex that's low spin. Hexaamine cobalt 3. It's a low spin complex, which means the splitting energy is large. Going back to basics, we know that cobalt 3 has 6 d electrons. Column 9, subtract that charge of 3, we get the answer 6. Those six electrons, which were normally spread out between all five orbitals when they were degenerate in energy, will in this case not spread out between all five. Because the splitting energy is large, the electrons don't spread out, but rather the electrons, which we add one at a time, spin up, spin up, spin up, will pair up rather than be added to the higher energy orbitals. That is, it's easier to pair up the electrons than it is to place it in the higher energy orbitals. And for that reason, hexaamine cobalt-3 is a diamagnetic complex. There are no unpaired electrons, which if you recall that frog levitating implies hexaamine cobalt-3 is repelled by a magnetic field. I know, another example will be worthwhile. Consider this complex, hexafluorocobaltate-3. It's an example of a high spin complex, which means the splitting energy between the d orbitals is going to be small. Cobalt-3 has six d electrons. Bear in mind, Although I've changed the ligand from ammonia to fluoride, I haven't changed the d-electron count. The d-electrons is all about the metal and its charge. Here, given the small splitting energy, 
we expect to see all six electrons spread through the 5d orbitals. That is, because the splitting energy is small, it's going to be easier to populate the higher energy orbitals than it would otherwise be to pair up the electrons. We again add them one at a time in the lower orbitals, 1, 2, and 3, then 2 up above, 4 and 5, with number 6 being placed on the left in the lower set of orbitals. Because I have four unpaired electrons, I would predict hexafluorocobaltate 3 to be paramagnetic. Now, if you were a chemist practically a thousand years ago, you could have made all these different complexes and examined their magnetic strength. And that would give you some sense as to essentially the ability of ligands to produce either, either strong field or weak field ligands. Here is a simple idea. As we increase the strength of the electrostatic field that the metal is found within, we expect the splitting energy to increase. We have hexaamine cobalt 3 with a large splitting energy and hexafluorocobaltate 3 with a small splitting energy. We refer to the hexaamine cobalt 3 as containing strong field ligand because of that large splitting energy and we refer to the cobalt, I should say the hexafluorocobaltate 3 as containing a weak field ligand because of the small splitting energy. Again, I can go about examining the field strengths of all sorts of different ligands and in doing so I can produce what's referred to as the spectrochemical series. The spectrochemical series will provide to us the relative field strengths for our ligands. Perhaps it would be easier to understand what I'm talking about with more examples. Consider carbon monoxide, that is carbonyl, and cyanide, or if you will, cyano. Carbon monoxide is a larger field strength than cyanide stronger field ligand. But these two carbon-containing ligands are stronger yet than the two nitrogen ligands that I just put on the screen, ethylene, diamine, and ammonia, which are stronger than the oxygen-containing ligands, water and hydroxide, which are stronger than our halides, fluoride, chloride, and bromide, and iodide. On this list, carbon monoxide produces the largest field strength, the strongest field, and therefore the largest split in energy. Iodide is the weakest field ligand and produces therefore the smallest split in energy. Generally, I think about carbon monoxide, cyanide, ethylene diamine, and ammonia as being strong field ligands producing large splitting energies. Technically, it's dependent on the metal ion to which they're bonded, but in general, strong field. And my halides, fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, is being weak field ligands. If it helps you at all, I might have you call to mind Mr. Dadson's favorite exercise tool. You know, that device with the springs, I think you call this the chest expander. It's really simple. You grab the grips and you pull. The stronger you are, the further apart you can stretch those handles. Well, when I see this individual online, the first thing that comes to mind is strong field. Look at it. this guy's ripped. And he's really just stretching those that chest expander to to no end. Strong field, large split. And then of course we have the weak field ligands and that's in some sense what Mr. Dadson looks like perhaps without the bandana and uh, <laughs> being weak 
we wouldn't expect the chest expander to get stretched nearly as far. So weak field, small split. Strong field, large split. God, I hope that helps. Let's look at some examples. You'll find this on the next lecture handout, which I've posted for you in the file, in case you don't want to write out the question. But we want to predict the number of unpaired electrons, and then, of course, the magnetism associated with hexa cyano chromate 2. Step one, identify the charge on the central metal cation. Since I have six cyanides, and it's negative four charge in total, that implies chromium is positive too. Then, once of course I know the charge in the metal, I ask myself how many d electrons might be there. Well, chromium is column six. I take two from six, and that explains why I have four d electrons. Again, we're always going to ignore the ligand electrons. Next. I recognize that cyanide is a strong field ligand. So if I have to predict what the split's gonna look like, I'm thinking it's gonna be large. Next up, I draw the pattern, which we associate with an octahedral complex. Two d orbitals high, three d orbitals low. And I then go about adding my electrons one at a time, spin up, each of the first three orbitals. And that fourth electron, well, because we have a strong field ligand and a large split energy, I'll add it to the lower set of orbitals. I have two unpaired electrons. And given the presence of the unpaired electron, I would identify this complex as being paramagnetic. Next example. Let us again predict the number of unpaired electrons and the magnetism, but this time in hexachloroferrate 2. So, the six chlorides, negative one each, yield a negative four charge if and only if iron is positive two. Iron is in column eight. I take two from eight, and that's how I come up with the six d electrons. Here, I have chloride, which I would predict to be a weak field ligand, giving rise to a small splitting energy. This octahedral complex has the two up, three bottom splitting pattern. I then go about adding my electrons, one at a time, spin up, spin up, spin up, spin down, spin down. Whoa, wait a minute, Dadson. Exactly. Spin up, spin up, spin up, followed by spin up, spin up, because the splitting energy is small. The last electron goes in, spin down. I have four unpaired electrons, and so this complex, as in the previous example, is paramagnetic.